Hi, Zach from the future here. When I say frame in this video, I mean 1 60th of a second or 16.67 milliseconds. The internal logic of fighting games has run at 60 FPS in Street Fighter 2, but newer games will render at a higher frame rate to produce cool visuals while keeping the same gameplay update rate. Okay, on with the video. Hi, I'm Zach Pill Yates, and this is Determinism, Decoupling, and Demystifying Rollback Netcode. Let's start with why I'm here and a quick primer on the different types of netcode. I'm a game developer and competitor. I've made many games you haven't played and competed in some that you have. Guilty Gear Strive has eaten up a lot of my time over the last year. The main thing it has over other fighting games is good netcode. Your favourite fighting game might be the deepest game with the sickest movement options, but if I hop online and it looks like this, I can't even play if I wanted to. Since 2020 and the virus, it's been hard to justify running or attending offline fighting game tournaments, and some games I love simply don't have netcode good enough for online play. So Strive filled the power vacuum of fighting games I actually wanted to play and could, and they've remained there ever since, while other fighting games have fallen by the wayside. So how did these games achieve netcode where it could be hard to tell the difference between local play and 300 milliseconds of online delay? The answer is rollback netcode. It's worth noting that while I'll be taking a look at this topic from the perspective of a 1v1 peer-to-peer -peer fighting game, it can apply to all different kinds of games and genres. I found a great talk while researching this topic by Yusar and King for how they implemented this style of netcode in an RTS game. But what is this style of netcode? What is rollback? The easiest way to understand this is to start with traditional delay-based netcode and see what problems we can find that make it not ideal for our purposes. Then we can talk about the ways these problems are solved or mitigated in a way that makes network experiences that are fun to fight in rather than fight against. So what is delay-based netcode? In delay-based netcode, we process our local input and send it to the remote player. They do the same for us, and after some delay, both clients can display the result of our input at the same time. This ensures the game state is always synchronized, but means our inputs will come out later than they would offline, which can feel sluggish. This is compounded by the fact that the delay is not constant. Sometimes your actions will be 4 frames later, and sometimes 10, and then back to 6. This feels awful for the player, who is used to the cadence and rhythm of button presses they need to execute combos. Some options in fighting games are designed around the human reaction time, and if you add some extra delay to that, it suddenly becomes unreactable and potentially degenerate. This is frustrating for players as the things they learn when playing offline with their friends won't apply when they go up against people online. In an ideal gaming utopia, offline and online feel the same because they are the same. You've beaten the speed of light and there's no delay between me pressing a button in England and my mate in the Netherlands seeing my character move on his screen. So how do we fix this problem and get closer to our ideal gaming utopia? The answer is to predict the future and time travel, and move at super speed, and I'm not joking, and we're gonna explain how this all works. In a rollback system, there is no delay between hitting a button and seeing your character perform the action on your screen. It feels just like offline play, despite being online. This is done by predicting the future, and simply rendering what we think your opponent is doing on that frame, even if we haven't got that information yet. While this might seem impossible, it's actually pretty easy. A frame is 16.67 milliseconds, and to predict what your opponent is doing on this new frame, we're just going to look at what they were doing last frame. If your opponent was walking forward 16 milliseconds ago, they're probably still walking forward now, so we don't need to wait to find out about that. If we're showing the input to the local player straight away, what does the opponent see before they receive our input? What do they see once they do receive it? How do we keep everything in sync? Well, before the input is received, the remote player isn't going to see anything change. The local player performs an action, and 45 milliseconds later the opponent receives it. We can simply skip the beginning 45 milliseconds of that animation. When looked at in slow motion, it looks jarring, but in real time, it's hard to tell that anything's happening at all, and everything ends up in sync. So this works great, until we predict something wrong. Most people aren't going to make more than 4 or 5 actions per second in a fighting game, so we are right like 90-95% to 95 of the time, but when we're wrong it's a big problem. If we thought that the opponent was walking forward for the last 4 frames and they actually jumped 4 frames ago, 
they're in the complete wrong place in our game. And everything's desynced and it's a disaster. We're going to roll back. This is where we go back in time to where we mispredicted. We add in the new input that we received and then we re-simulate the game forward all before the next render frame. So that's the theory of rollback netcode, and in theory, it's all going to be fine. But actually implementing this system presents a lot more challenges because there are some assumptions that I've made that we need to address to make it work practically. For example, for this to work, our game needs to be deterministic. We need to be able to take a state and a set of inputs and always end up in the same future state as a result of those inputs every single time across any device that will play our game whether it's on Windows, Linux, Android, whatever CPU it uses, it all needs to end up exactly the same so that we remain in sync. There's no authoritative server or game state here. We just need to simulate the game the same way on every machine. This is more difficult than it might sound because of floating points. Floating point numbers, which drive a lot of the math within Unity Engine, have different standards depending on CPU architecture. There is no guarantee that two computers will get the same result in doing basically any operation with floating points. They could be slightly off, and this could desync our entire game. The solution is to implement fixed point math within C Sharp. Fixed point math allows us to represent some decimal numbers while using deterministic integers in the background. This means our calculations will always have the same output on all machines. Here's my implementation. If you want to read through it, the GitHub with all the source code for this project is in the description. The alternative to determinism is to simply send the entire game state between players, rather than simulating it on each machine separately. While this is much easier to implement, the amount of bandwidth used increases greatly. In my deterministic implementation, we simply send the frame ID, the motion inputs, and the button inputs, and this takes up a total of 4 bytes, resulting in a much more lightweight online solution. The other assumption I've made is that we can update the game state multiple times per render frame. This means we need to veer off of Unity's main thread and make our own update function. Here's mine in my game simulation thread, and it's one of four threads used in my implementation. So let's go through all the threads. We have Unity's main thread, which is usually all you're allowed to use in a Unity project, and then we have three C sharp threads game simulation thread, and two networking threads. The networking threads are for receiving and sending input respectively, and I wrote this in pure C Sharp using sockets rather than using any of Unity's built-in networking solutions, mainly because they either had a bunch of stuff I didn't need or were not finished yet, as Unity perpetually is, and it also gave me a deeper understanding of how these systems could work. Let's talk about serialization. Our input object contains the ID for the current frame, the directional input for this frame, and the set of button inputs for this frame. We're going to pack this information down into a byte array that can be easily sent over the network. The code for this may look daunting, but the idea is pretty simple, so let's walk through it. The frame ID is split across the first two bytes, allowing for 65,535 unique frame IDs, which maths out to about 18 minutes of gameplay. Typically, fighting game matches are best of three with 90 second rounds, so this may seem like overkill, but without the additional byte, we only get 255 unique frames, or four and a quarter seconds, which is obviously not enough. Directional inputs take up another byte. These are stored as a value from 0 to 9, representing the different directions a player may input. This is known as numpad notation as a common way of representing directional inputs in fighting games. We take in these inputs with the Unity's input system, which gives them to us as a horizontal and vertical axis, which I convert to the desired notation. The button inputs take up the remaining byte in our array, and each button has four possible states, which are press this frame, held from the previous frame, release this frame, or no input this frame. With the four button inputs in my demo, this can be packed into a single byte, though it is possible to support two more button inputs without increasing the amount of information sent by packing these bits into the unused four bits in the directional input byte, which my demo can handle if additional attacks are implemented. In this example code, we have an input object with a frame ID of 1, 2, 3, 4, a directional input of up, back, and button inputs of none, pressed, held, and released. When packed into a byte array, we get the values 4, 2, 10, 2, 2, 8, and 7, which may not mean much to us, but has all the information we need to reconstruct the inputs on the remote client once sent. As you can see, when we do this process in reverse, we get the same values out. 
let's run through one-ish frames of our game. I say ish because the render frames and the game logic frames are decoupled, so this isn't quite how it works in practice because it's all asynchronous. If we start in Unity's main thread, we receive an input from our local player. This input is sent to our outgoing networking thread, where it is serialized and sent to the remote player. Our incoming network thread will receive an input from the remote player and send it to the game simulation. Our original local input is also sent to the game simulation from the Unity main thread, where it is added to a table of inputs with an ID number for the current frame. When we receive the network input with the same frame ID, we'll know which frame it was from and be able to insert it into the table next to the local input and then perform our rollbacks to fix any mispredictions we made. We then update the game state using these local and remote inputs and the resultant frame is spat out back to Unity's main thread where it can be rendered the next time Unity performs a render call with a bunch of cool non-deterministic effects or something. It doesn't matter at that point, we're out of the need for determinism, as it doesn't impact our game simulation under the hood. This is known as the Great Divide in the aforementioned RTS talk by Yassar and King. Being able to have a stripped-down, deterministic version of your game state that can then be rendered non-deterministically with all of the random effects your art team desires. That being said, I don't have an art team and this is more of a framework that can be built off of. With all that out of the way, it's time to finally look at the demo I've put together. First, a test I wrote to show the rollbacks are working correctly. Here on frame 240, the game will roll back to frame 120. This is a much larger rollback than we'd ever need in practice at 2 seconds, but it's done to show that I can serialize our game state and load previous game states at any point. Most games will limit the rollbacks to about 7 frames at a time. This is much harder to spot in practice as it will happen between render frames and only roll back a handful of frames rather than 2 whole seconds. But that was just a local test that I did offline. Let's take the demo online and play with my friend in Amsterdam. Although I use the word play lightly as again, this isn't a fully featured game. This is just a test to show that the system is working. I've also had him stream his POV to me on Discord so I could capture that too. Be aware that this will have lag compared to what he sees on his screen as we have to stream the video and send it over the network too. I've also got a UI set up to help understand what's going on in the background. We've got the render FPS and simulation FPS separated as they work on different threads, the local frame from the game simulation thread, and the most recent remote frame received from the network thread. There's also a counter for the number of rollbacks that are being performed, and we've got the whole thing operating deterministically under the hood while rendering some animations I stole from Mixamo in the Unity thread. I have different moves for each of the buttons just to show that that is being sent across the network and processed correctly. They don't actually do anything, but this is a networking discussion and not a fighting game design discussion. Hopefully you can see how the systems have implemented can be used as a framework to build upon and make a fighting game. This is something I might consider doing over the summer, and designing for network play from the ground up is a good place to be. It's much harder to retrofit rollback into a game that was not designed for it, although it has been done. I will also be working as a networking programmer on an upcoming indie game, although there's not too much I can share about that at this time. But creating this demo helped me land that role. And it's something I thought about doing for a while but wasn't sure if I'd be able to pull it off. Having this demo working and being able to play with my friend in Amsterdam is pretty cool, and I hope this video helped you learn something about rollback netcode and systems. I definitely learned a lot making it, and it's my first network project, so I'm not claiming to be a expert on this stuff. This is just how I went about it. I'm sure there are other ways to do things, but I didn't see any videos like that while I was trying to learn. So I hope this helps some people, and if you have any questions or other comments, then feel free to leave them below. Uh, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you're probably the person marking this for my university assignment, so if you have any comments, email me, I guess. Uh, thanks.